Welcome to the 12th annual UC Davis Pre-Med and Pre-Health um, Professions National Conference. Today, this is our final speaker. We have uh, Yvonne Maldadon, how do I pronounce her name? Maldadona? Maldonado. M Maldonado. Um, she's a Senior Associate Dean for Faculty Development and Diversity at Stanford School of Medicine. And please give her your full attention and we will have time for questions at the end. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thank you. I'm sure you are all um, have had a long day, and it's been very exciting. Uh, it's a beautiful campus. Um, I have a lot of friends whose kids have come to school here, so um, thank you for your attention. So I only have a few slides today, and I'm happy to make this um, interactive as well, um, and or we can leave time for questions. But. Um, um, as you heard, I'm uh, a Senior Associate Dean for Faculty Development and Diversity in the, in the uh, School of Medicine. And I also have several other roles. Um, that role is the most recent. I'm the, um, the Director of the Global Child Health Program for the School of Medicine in the Department of Pediatrics, as well as uh, uh, the Chief of the Pediatric Infectious Disease Pro uh, uh, Division um, at the um, the medical school and at the Packard Children's Hospital. So um, I've been um, quite busy in a lot of uh, areas that you would consider leadership roles and have learned a lot of lessons along the way, along the bumps um, along the way. And mostly what I'm going to talk about today are just general observations. And um, in terms of all of you who are looking into fields in pre-health and pre-medicine, really talking about uh, a little bit about my own road to um, where I am now, uh, just as an example, and also what I am doing in my role as the uh, senior uh, associate dean for uh, uh, promoting diversity, uh, gender, race, and ethnicity in other areas as well in terms of faculty, but how this can also apply at the undergraduate level and in other health-related uh, professions as well. So um, as you just probably heard a little bit earlier from our colleague who was talking about LGBT issues, um, uh, diversity is a critical issue that we are now starting to address um, at, the, um, at, a, at very high levels in education. So in college, uh, in graduate schools, in health professional schools as well. And defining diversity is um, not easy because um, we are all unique and there are many facets to each of us. But um, in general, I think um, it is helpful to at least understand that diversity can involve many, many different facets of our life. So we don't, you know, in the old days, um, we talked about, well, uh, racial and ethnic um, uh, minorities and women and men and but we have to realize that our society is very heterogeneous and very rich culturally and so I think all of these areas are very important and today I'll focus specifically about the role of women and how we um, how far we have come what are areas that we can improve in and areas um, where we have already um, some action items on the table here, here in California, at my school, and across the country. So um, uh, I, again, I'm speaking as a, a dean who really deals with um, faculty. So my job um, at Stanford, I actually, was, the first thing I did when I took this job was change the charge of the office. So it used to be known as the Office of Leadership and Diversity. And in thinking long and hard about, first of all, whether I wanted to take on the position, because I had many other um, opportunities to work. I actually do a lot of work in global health. Um, I'm going to be leaving tomorrow to go to Mexico and to uh, Geneva to work on polio eradication program research programs. And so I really had to think about what is my role going to be in the dean's office um, around faculty development or leadership and diversity and what can I do or can I do anything? 
And what I thought about was um, when this office was first started um, several years ago, the idea was we needed to find more women in leadership positions and put more women in leadership positions. And I still think that's a critical area um, around in any field. I think, unfortunately, this is not just an issue around health and medicine. This is an issue in areas um, in the tech sector, in business, around Fortune 500 companies, CEOs. Anywhere you look, we still haven't broken through that uh, ceiling yet in the numbers um, that I think we should be. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So, But what I really wanted to address was um, I didn't want uh, people, at, at least in my school of medicine, to feel that if they weren't in a position that had a title after it, that is, if they weren't in a leadership position that had a title, that they were failing as leaders. I believe that if you are a health provider, if you are taking care of patient populations uh, around the world and around the country, and if you are um, leading your community as a role model, you are a leader. So having a title after your name, while it is important and while we do need to have diversity at that level, um, is not the only metric for uh, being considered a leader in a community. In particular, um, healthcare providers, I think, are one of the few area, uh, professions still where we have confidence in our in our, in our profession. So I think that when people have done polls looking at who would they trust, people still trust their physician, their healthcare providers. I think they still generally um, believe that we have, um, we have something important uh, to do in, the, in their lives and to help them maintain their health and help them when they're ill. So I think that we still have very prominent roles in our communities and in fact, I am an academic physician, I've been an academic physician my whole career, but many, many doctors and nurses and other healthcare providers will not be in academic medicine and will still be very important leaders in our community. So I think that um, not having a title is not, uh, having a title is not as important as making sure that in my uh, role in the School of Medicine, that we make sure that women and other diverse populations are trained well so that they can handle these um, de facto leadership roles, so that they can thrive in their roles, in their professions, and so that they can have the proper work-life balance. It's a, it's, I'm not saying that we're going to have a perfect solution to all of these issues, but we can tackle those and we can start by at least acknowledging these that these exist. And once you at least acknowledge something, you demystify it, you make it um, an issue that can be dealt with, and you can start trying to be innovative about how to deal with that. So of course, as we know, women um, really uh, are coming through their careers in their uh, 20s, 30s, and 40s in their, at the beginning of their careers. And that's the time when they're having their children. And your family is the focus of your life. That's the most important thing in your life. And yet, more and more of us have careers. And how do we balance the development and nurturing of our family while we're trying to develop and nurture our careers as well? So that is really the main crux of the, I think, the biggest debate that we have across the country as we discuss women in leadership in any role, whether it's medicine, law, business, it doesn't matter. Now, um, some people have taken the stance that women shouldn't be in leadership positions until they've gotten through those years, and um, I believe that that really is a decision that the woman herself with her family should make. I am not saying that's the wrong decision. I'm just saying that that is a decision that is a personal one and that people can do what they think works for them. Um, and uh, I've been uh, a physician for a long time, way before you were born. I uh, am married to an attorney and uh, he's quite busy and actually he works um, 
in Oakland, so it's 40 miles away from where we live. So he's not usually in the area um, during the days um, when most of the activities happen. I have three children, they're all grown up now, although we're still very involved with their lives. I don't think you ever stop uh, working with your children and helping them out, but um, at least on a day-to-day, -day, um, just time and physical ba basis, when they're growing up, you spend a lot of time with them. And that is probably the most difficult time for a woman when, again, she's trying to balance both of those um, big, very important roles in her life. Um, uh, when I first started off as a physician, um, there were women who were more senior than I who uh, had different approaches to this. Some of the women said, um, I believe it's not appropriate to, um, to have children if I'm gonna go into a full-time career, so I'm not gonna have kids. And I think that for them, that choice probably worked well. I actually, the woman that I work with who's my boss, who's the vice dean, so she's really uh, 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 running the, uh, along with the, the, the dean himself, um, runs really the whole school of medicine. She actually started off that way. She and her husband got married. She's an MD, PhD. She got married uh, in medical school um, and uh, decide, they decided they weren't gonna have children, but they went along and after some years of being married, they thought, you know, I think you know, we're probably okay now. We, they wound up having two wonderful children and they're quite happy, they're adults now, and uh, she was able to kind of do both. So sometimes people change their minds. One of the other ways that women have dealt with leadership uh, or just you know their career issues and subsequent leadership positions is I think somewhat harmful and that was again something that really happened primarily a little before my time and it was uh, kind of to say, um, I'm just gonna be one of the boys. I'm gonna be like the guys and if I act like the guys and if I behave like them and do what they do, then I will be one of them and they will accept me as one of the guys. And that, in my opinion, has not worked. In fact, one of my colleagues actually wrote a book about it. Um, her name is Fran Connolly. She was a neurosurgeon at Stanford. And she wrote a book called Walking Out on the Boys. And if you ever want to read a little bit about what happened to her um, and her revelation at, at her, she was probably around my age when she realized that that wasn't going to work for her, and it actually didn't work in a very big way because she was turned down for a very important position um, and um, it led to a lot of changes at our medical school and around the country around issues of gender inequity. And remember, most of us are very quantitative people. I want to see some scientific background for a particular program or move, and that was the other thing that I dealt with when I thought about this office. And I thought, well, where's the data? Where's the evidence? Um, I don't think we need to have a lot of data to know that it takes a lot of work to raise a family and to try to juggle a career. I think we all can figure that out. The question is, how do we deal with that? And can we study it? And we have done a number of studies at Stanford and other places, not just to understand what happens, but how to deal with that. And um, there, I, if I have time, I'll talk a little bit about that. But um, so I think running away from yourself doesn't work. I would say, and we all probably know this now, but I, it's something that I um, saw happen to some of my senior colleagues is trying to run away and not accepting yourself for who you are will always come back at some point in your life. Maybe not today, maybe not in 10 years, but at some point, you have, to be well, you have to be comfortable in your own skin. And I know it sounds really simple and uh, obvious, but I think sometimes that doesn't happen. And so we need to be able to feel comfortable in who we are and make decisions based on where we think we need to be now and where we want to be later. The other thing to remember is that we have time to develop our roles in our lives. Um, one of your own or one, how many of you are from Davis here? Any hands? Oh. So the chair, the chair of pediatrics is a woman here, and she came to Stanford a few weeks ago, and she gave a talk called The Future of Women in Pediatrics. Now, I'm a pediatrician, and it was one of the best talks I've ever heard. She talked about 
her productivity as a faculty member, as a chair, and her national, regional, and international recognition, and her productivity, and her promotions. And we all, we have very specific ways that we all get promoted, and I might talk about that in a bit if I have time. And she said, you know, I was talk thinking about, so she gave, and I wasn't gonna do this today, but I thought, let's make this a little more personal. You can, she put up all the numbers. Now, of course, she had a whole hour with physicians to talk about this. And she did a great job of showing, here's where we are in this country, and here's where we, how much, where we have to get to, or where we would like to be. But the most important part of what she did is she said, you know, I tracked my own time from the time I got married, or started in pediatrics and got married and had kids, and I tracked my, I knew where my family, my personal life was over that period of time. And she interspersed pictures of herself with her family. And she also tracked her academic career. And of course her career, because she was a chair and she's in, very well known, her career went this way, right? It went up. But it was interesting because along the way, she actually put up little arrows along the career, the timeline of when she got married, when she had her kids, different events in her life that were personal. And you saw that the line didn't just do this, it kind of went like this, right? And the idea again is that many of us feel like we have to get somewhere, we have a goal, we have a destination. But anybody who's an athlete knows the old saying that really the, uh, the joy in, in doing this is in the journey, not the destination. And if you don't enjoy that journey, you're gonna miss out on all of the things that happen in your family life. Um, you may pick up some of it here and there, but really we have to merge those things. And for some people, that's gonna be a compromise that they can't make. Uh, but for many of us more and more, it has become easier. And part of the reason it's become easier is because institutions around the world are realizing that you can't ignore 50% of the population. You can't say that we, we are only people who don't, uh, aren't stay-at-home moms uh, uh, can uh, get anything done. We, can, we can't have it all, but we can share our lives um, provided there are resources for us to do that. And I'm, again, I'm not saying that's for everybody, but I think for medicine and women, you've already made a choice that you're thinking of being in healthcare. And think about the nurses in the field who really have very extended shifts to do and are the backbone of our healthcare industry. And again, have been able to be successful. So I think in terms of healthcare and leadership with women, we're very clear that that's very important and can be done. And the same can be true for physicians and other healthcare providers. Now, the other question that comes up for me at Stanford, uh, because I remember I have to deal with the faculty and the deans and the chairs who are picking all these women to come to Stanford and be faculty members and be heads of different programs is, well, we know it's the right thing to do to bring women on board, but where's the data that it really helps us? And um, it's a little disappointing to hear that question because I would say that being the right thing to do is a pretty good reason in and of itself. But there's more and more data that having women uh, in the workforce and having a diverse workforce, whether it's women or racial ethnic differences or any of the different things you saw in that picture earlier, how do those help? Well, they help in, in two, I'm gonna talk about two major areas. The first is more general and that has to do with the business approach. Um, and what we've seen in Silicon Valley is that the numbers are starting to trickle out. And then I guess it's no surprise, I live, near the Silic I live in the Silicon Valley, and you only have to walk around a little bit to see that um, it's a heavily white male-oriented field. Um, and there are a lot of efforts to try to change that. Um, and why would that be? Why would, it, why would a business model have to do that? It's, they aren't always interested in the right thing to do, they're interested in the bottom line. And it turns out that there's more and more data that shows that when you have diverse groups working together, and these have been done under well-controlled studies, you actually wind up with more innovative ideas, more uh, differences in ideas, greater 
breadth of ideas because you don't have a group of people who think the same way, who act the same way, who like the same things, right? And so when you have groups that include many interests, many backgrounds, you're much more likely to tackle a problem and come up with more solutions and more innovative solutions uh, than a group that's not so diverse. And there's very good evidence to that regard. The um, tech community has actually uh, been in the news quite a bit about this recently. In fact, just this week, uh, one of the CEOs of a major um, tech firm, uh, soft, uh, tech company, uh, was having an interactive panel where he was talking about women in, in tech industries and saying, you know, women shouldn't, and I'm paraphrasing him, but he said, women shouldn't ask for a raise. It's like karma. It'll just come to them if it's meant to be. And people, and the next day he's, he said, oh, I really didn't mean that. I meant that, you know, I just, I said it, I, I articulated it poorly. I think women should ask for raises. Um, well, thank you for that permission. But, so again, it brings up this issue that, we, that still, there's still this feeling out there that um, even though we're 70, 80 percent, make 70 to 80 percent less than our male counterparts for the same jobs in general, um, there's still this lack of urgency and there's still this idea that, well, you know, you'll float to the top if you're good enough. And we all know that I don't, that, that that's not the model, the male model in general. So again, we have permission now to ask for raises. So, um, but the idea again is, so, so getting away from just that issue, if you think about how most of the tech, and I'm, again, I'm focusing on the Silicon Valley because that's what I know, but this is true in any market-driven business. Who buys most of the products in this country? It's women and young people. Um, how, the, the head of the household is usually doing other things. So really, if you think about it, how are you going to market products to the, to the women in the community when you're not, a, when you don't think like a woman, you don't know what the women's um, uh, approach might be to buying uh, in, in her, um, for her household or for herself. When we looked at this at our Packard Children's Hospital, we were trying to see how do we get our message about the excellent programs we have at Packard Hospital. We hired somebody to come out and see who, how do people make their decisions about who their doctor's gonna be. And of course, for children especially, most of the decisions are made by the, by the mother because she, in general, is the one who's looking. And how does she make these decisions? She looks on the internet, she talks to her friends, but there is a lot of marketing going on, on the internet. So you need to know how your market thinks if you're gonna be able to sell to them. And this is what I think a new dilemma that's been argued in the literature now in the tech community is we need to have diversity in our workforce so that we can sell to a diverse workforce. And um, again, if it's, if it's gonna make money, it's clearly not a bad idea. So that's the the business model for diversity, including women, and especially women. But if you think about healthcare, um, our country is a very diverse place. It is becoming more and more diverse. We are gonna have, uh, we are go soon going to become a country that has no major group uh, that, that is, represents over 50% of the population. And that'll happen in our lifetimes. And yet, when we talk, and in addition to that, we are gonna have a big influx of need of, of, uh, of baby boomers coming into the healthcare system as my generation gets older and needs more care. Um, and, and we have many different kinds of people, uh, backgrounds, but we know for sure that half of us are gonna be women. So we need providers who know either are women or who know how to deal with women. So I, am, I think women's leadership can really inform that. And one of the ways we can do that is by being there, making the programs, helping to train our colleagues so that they are culturally competent. I think many of you know what that means, right? Culturally competent means that you acknowledge that there are other people with different viewpoints, different cultural contexts. And this is critical for healthcare because these are people who are putting 
the very most private most thoughts and um, actions in their lives um, at your feet for you to utilize in helping them stay healthy or in helping them be cured. Um, I took that response, we all take that responsibility very seriously and it is a very, it's a tremendous honor, but it's also a very large and important responsibility. And you need to be able to not necessarily know everything about that person's culture or background, but you need to be able to understand how to respect it, how to um, get that person to divulge some of that, that part of them so that you can help them with their health care needs. So clearly, as we become more diverse in the United States, uh, we are going to need to have a more diverse workforce. And again, because women make up half of the population of this country, we have to be at the table making those decisions as well. So again, when you see this, I always bring this up to my faculty because they always say, well, again, it's the right thing to do, but where's the evidence that it's really important to others other than the person who's getting uh, included. And so again, diversity of thought is central to innovation. It's very clear there's a lot of data now to support that. In, again, achieving a culturally competent clinical workforce is much better for patient care. I, I'm bilingual, I speak Spanish, and I can tell you that when I'm in the room speaking to a family in Spanish, even if they're not from a country that I'm familiar with, they, there's, a, there's a barrier that's been taken down for that family. And again, I'm not saying everyone should speak Spanish, but I'm saying you can see that the impact of having a culturally welcoming and including environment really helps break those barriers for the patients. And also, it's really important for us to build our next generation of academic leaders. As we move along, um, you know, my generation is uh, getting ready. Many, many of my generation are starting to retire. Some of us probably won't be able to afford retirement for some time. But your generation is going to be taking on that role. And we want you to be the diverse workforce that's going to come up with all the next great ideas for all of us. So this is just a picture I put in there uh, to show you some of my colleagues here on the, the, and of course this is only a few people out of uh, 1,500 faculty that we have, but this is our chair of psychiatry, Dr. Laura Roberts and Dr. Gabriel Garcia, who's an internist. He is um, our, uh, just stepped down as our dean of admissions. Um, Odetta Harris, she's the chief of neurosurgery at the Veterans Hospital in Palo Alto, and a group of our basic scientists here. And that's a picture that I put in there for uh, PR reasons, not for you guys. <laughs> so um, I'm going to come to the end here, and I uh, wanted to just give you some uh, a couple of little studies that have come about in recently, because you'll probably hear these terms. And one of the areas that we need to deal with, I think, in terms of training, I certainly deal with it at the School of Medicine. Uh, with our senior leadership and um, our fa and our faculty in general as well, and so do they on the main campus. And I think one of your the leaders in this area is here, Dr. David Acosta, is very involved and is one of the leaders in these areas. Is the area of unconscious bias? How many of you have heard about that? Okay, good. So you know, I'm going to tell you a story about unconscious bias and how pervasive it is how automatic it is, and potentially how damaging it can be. It's a story about hurricanes. It has nothing to do with people. So, uh, and has anybody, did I tell this story to any of you already? No, you haven't been to the last session, sorry. So, um, there was a group of meteorologists who had um, all of the historical data for the last several decades worth of hurricanes in the United States. And they were trying to catalog what the severity and the damage and the losses were um, around hurricanes over the last several decades. I think one of the aims was to see if the hurricanes had gotten worse, uh, how are we dealing with financial losses, et cetera. And it was a very robust data set. And one of the things that, w what they found was very interesting and very confusing. They found that when you analyzed um, the effect of hurricanes on l l number of deaths, number one, from hurricanes and, and cost, and damage uh, from each one of them, that the one that 
female, hurricanes that were named after women were more likely to cause more deaths and damage than hurricanes that were named after men. Now, if any, I'm sure many of you know, have heard a little bit about the story, but I'm gonna finish up the story here to make a point. And also, many of you know how hurricanes are named. So hurricanes are named in alphabetical order. We all know that because as you go along, you say, okay, that one's named B, and the next one's gonna be a C. And for a long time, they were named uh, one year all women, next year all men, and then now they go through where they name them uh, alternating male and female names. So I, don't, I guess that might have been another diversity issue, not sure. But the point is that they, um, yes, and actually it was, people were offended. They said, well, wait a second, let's, you know, we want them to be mixed up. We don't want hurricanes being branded as males or females, so they mix them up. So, but they're, but they're very organized. And the more important thing is from a scientific perspective is that they are randomized, right? This is a very random process. So one year they're um, male, next year they're female. They switched, but they're still every other one. So you, it doesn't matter which one comes up, you get that name. Um, and, um, and then they're alphabetical. So that is the definition of a double blind randomized trial. And that is a very robust way to study outcomes. So we know that that was not a biased way to name hurricanes, and yet we found this very striking finding. So what happened was that some behavioral scientists looked at the data, and they thought about it a different way. And by the way, it was a woman who thought about this. So again, bringing back the idea that you know, women may have a different take on the data, because the meteorologists were a little stumped by it. They didn't know why this might be. So she went back and started presenting scenarios of different levels of hurricanes. So I forget what the levels are. Um, you know, they go from one to five, I think. And so they came up with scenarios where hurricanes were uh, mild, medium, and high intensity. And they didn't give people the intensity level, they just gave the criteria. And then they named some of them after women and some after men. And then they asked people who lived in these hurricane areas to check off what they would do to prepare for this kind of a hurricane. They didn't say anything about the name, they just said, if a hurricane had this, you know, this velocity of wind and it had this, it, it was this big and et cetera, what would you do to prepare for this hurricane? And what they found at the end of their study was that hurricanes that were named after women uh, were taken less seriously than hurricanes that were named after men. I mean, it sounds silly, right? But, and by that, I mean that people were less likely to prepare for a hurricane that was named after a woman. They were less likely to leave the area if the hurricane was named after a woman, even if it was a more severe hurricane than the hurricane that was named after a man. So, and more importantly, again, showing you the level of detail to this, the more feminine the hurricane name sounded, the less likely people were, like, were to take it seriously. So were people biased against female hurricanes? Of course not, no, they weren't. Do people feel in general, I mean, do many people feel that they're biased against women? No, you would ask a lot of your colleagues, I'm not, I don't have any strong feelings against women. But these are unconscious biases. So by definition, we don't know they're there. We don't know they're there. Now these unconscious biases, we all have them. We are all biased against something or someone. It's built into us, it's a defense mechanism, it's a fight or flight reaction. We have to be able to respond rapidly. We have to make decisions sometimes that are not based on ration and ration, rational thought and logic. It's based on our cultural context, how we were raised, what we see around us, and what the expectations are. But you can see how deep these unconscious biases can go, something that we would never have thought would have been true. And so the good news here is that we can recognize these and say, well, you know, it is important to have these sometimes. We need to know how to respond. You can't sit there and ponder what your next move is gonna be every day, you'd be paralyzed. So you have to make some decisions. But 
You, we actually have training programs. These have been developed nationally, and we've been giving those at Stanford, and I'm sure they're being done here, to train our leadership to be cognizant of biases that may be unconscious, so that when people are making key leadership decisions, they are thinking about this issue. Am I really being totally fair, totally unbiased? And the permission for somebody else to call you on it. Wait a second, are you really being fair? Let's think about this. I'm not blaming you, this could be unconscious, but let's look at this again. Before we appoint that person as chair or that person as chief, let's think about the other person again. What was wrong with this person? Let's take the name away. Um, there are many, many studies like that in humans as well. Now, in humans, it's easier to say, well, there could have been, they might have known the person. Or, or, but when you look at hurricanes, there's just no way you can argue that we knew that hurricane before we decided not to respond. So it's really important to see this. And there is very good data uh, looking at this. Women are less likely to get promoted. They're less likely to get strong letters of recommendation. The letters are going to be less... Um, less uh, uh, robust, e e all things being equal. And I tell one story about one of my colleagues at Stanford who is transgender. He, um, he, is, uh, he used to be a woman. He's a very well-known international scientist. And uh, when he was still going through his change, um, he wrote about this. He uh, was told um, by many of his colleagues uh, who didn't know his background and just knew him as a man, you know, I, I know your sister's work and your sister's work was not as good as your work. Well, he doesn't have a sister, it was him. So it was really interesting. He wrote about this, I think he wrote it in the, uh, an editorial in Science, uh, a magazine, which is a very prominent. So again, um, I don't think people mean to do this, but again, we, we need to, and so we just need to be aware of this. And I think one of the things is not to be bitter, not to be angry, not to feel defeated, but to say, this is, let's acknowledge that this exists. And as somebody brought up in one of the previous sessions, we need to be able to uh, acknowledge this as people who have biases, and if we're the recipient of the bias, we need to learn how to stand up to it and say, and call people out in a respectful way and say, Let's think about this again. Let's go back over and be able to stand up. And one of the things that we're offering at Stanford is leadership training, not only for, um, but for all people, men, women, all, all groups. Everyone needs to have uh, training to understand how do you negotiate, how do you say no, how do you, uh, you know, try to achieve work-life balance that works for you. Um, but women, more than men, statistically are going to be more likely to back off, to say, yes, I'll take on that extra assignment, even though I have other things to do and I really want to get home. And the reason that women do it, and these have been shown in studies, is because they're more likely to be afraid that they're, it's going to affect their promotion or their career advancement if they don't say, no, if they don't say yes. Men don't have the same, statistically, have the same compulsion to say yes to taking on extra assignments. So therefore, they're more likely to be able to focus on their work and be promoted and move forward. Those are things that we need to, we are working with and we are, we are working on with both our men leaders and our male colleagues and, our, and women. We need our male colleagues to be more willing to take things on instead of letting them go because the women, they know the, there's always the women will take on the role. And our male and female leaders to not just think, well, let's give it to the woman because she'll be less likely to give me a hard time and say, no, I don't want to do it. So those are things that we can do actively. And, our, and in ourselves, we can also be much more aware uh, of how we are responding and be more careful. I actually face this on a daily basis, even at my stage of my career, I still, in fact, yesterday something came up where I really had to fight back something on something that kept coming back time and time again. And I said, I don't know how many times I have to say no. I can't do that. It's not acceptable. There was, there was something that I really just felt was not going to work out. And in the end, we came up with a different solution. It took a lot of work. And instead of getting angry and storming out, I just sat down. I said, OK, I'll help you with this but you need to come up with a different solution and I'll help you, and we did, we came up with it. So it doesn't go away, but it can be a productive discussion as long as everybody's respectful at the table.
So I'm going to show you my last slide because I know we're running out of time and I'm sure you're all hungry. Um, this is just a structure of women in academic medicine. It's a true pyramid, which means that there are, and this is, uh, there are more women at the bottom of the pyramid, and as you get up the pyramid, there are less women at leadership positions. This is where I am right now. I'm a dean. I'm also a full professor, so um, I don't, I have to say that I don't have a magic formula for how this happens. I think um, that part of it has to do with, again, trying to feel comfortable in your own skin. Having a mentor is critical. I still talk to my mentor, who's a senior person at Stanford also, and even this thing that happened to me yesterday, I, I called her right before. I said, here's what I want to do. What do you think? And she said, yeah, sounds good, but I would also do this. So having that person who can help you is great, and you can do the return the favor as well. Um, one of the things that we mostly worry about are this group here. I don't know if you can see the arrow. Oh, I, you know what? The, I'm sorry, the arrow's not showing up there. See where the assistant professors are, where it says 43%, and then the, the associate professors. And the reason we worry most about that group is because you can see that over half of the instructors, so the base level, are women. And as you move to that middle level, that's going to be the future of medicine. Those are the women who are going to be our leaders, because they're going to go up to the top. They're going to be the full professors, chairs, and deans. And those are the years when people are raising their children, are going to have a harder time to try to balance. And so what we're trying to do around the country is figure out how we can balance. Stanford has a faculty flexibility program. We were funded by several sources, including the Sloan Foundation, to try to develop a faculty a flexibility program. We have a pilot study that we're analyzing now to see how it works. And it got a lot of publicity because we were helping people by getting them free um, uh, daycare, when emergency daycare, free meals on nights when they had to work late, um, uh, free uh, housekeeping, and then people said, well, you know, everybody needs that. And we said, yes, but we want to see if it actually has an impact on the ability of the person to be more productive at work. And so we're still analyzing that, and many other people around the country are still searching for answers. One of the other ways is to make part-time appointments or extend the tenure clock. That is, extend the time to promotion so you have more time if you need it while you're raising your children. Um, and so I think is the exciting thing is we have people in that pipeline now, assist, assist, instructors, assistant, and associate professors who are women. And that as time goes on, we can build these programs in to support women so that they can stay in leadership roles in academic medicine, stay in leadership roles in their clinical world um, as heads of hospitals, as clinical um, uh, practices, uh, role models in the community so that we can try to balance and not say that we can have it all, but that we can at least try to balance the pieces of our lives that, that, um, that are important to us. So I'll stop there, and if we have time, um, I'll take a couple questions, but um, thank you for your attention. Yes. What's my ethnicity? So I grew up, I'm, my family's from Mexico. And I grew up and half, I call myself half generation because I, I was born in the US, but, and my parents came to the US early on and we were born and raised here, but my mom was a working mom. So every summer I would move back to Mexico and live with my grandmother while my mom, because it was too expensive to have childcare. So I, I've spent a lot, of, in fact, I still work in Mexico quite a bit. Yes. So the question is, what would be good, um, inst good um, programs and initiatives uh, for pre-med students? I think uh, it's important to get involved with your pre-med organization. There is a women in medicine program, uh, and I think they have maybe some pre-med uh, uh, roles as well. Um, I think if you have, don't have a program at your institution, uh, starting your own program where you can at least support each other. Um, speaking for myself, again, this was many years ago. Um, we, when I was at, uh, I went to UCLA undergrad and then to Stanford, 
we used to get together uh, on a regular basis. And even just the idea of getting together with other people um, that have sh similar experiences is really, um, it's very uplifting, it's very reaffirming. And it, it, you just feel uh, more um, able to be in control of your, uh, your, your career decisions because you can brainstorm with other people who have the same kind of experiences. So I would say join other organizations or small support groups or even just kind of regular meetings with people where you can just um, either social or uh, what I'm doing, for example, with the women faculty, but this could certainly be done at any level, I sponsor monthly luncheons for the women faculty in the, in the clinical side, because we have basic science faculty and clinical faculty, and um, we do it on both sides. And I'll bring in a speaker, but I make the lunch in an hour and a half. People can come in and out if they need to, because people are, beepers are going crazy all the time. So the first few, like the first third of it, people are just getting to know each other. The second, third, we have a speaker who will talk about negotiating skills or how they, you know, their story about how they got through. Hearing other people's stories is really helpful because you can say, oh, I'm not the only one who went through that. It's not just me because we tend to take on a lot of this guilt or burden on ourselves. There must be something wrong with me. And, then, and so that kind of thing can be very helpful. And it also can get you to, you know, we find out at some of these meetings wait a second, you had that problem too? So did I. Maybe we should take this to the chief or something. So sometimes just that communication can help, you know, with brainstorming for how to solve problems as well. Great. Okay, well, thank you so much. Have a good evening and enjoy tomorrow.